Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, so let me get started. We've got lots of interesting things to talk about. Um, now, software is eating the world. Um, originally, software used to be a kind of a cost center. We used to think of software as stuff to save money, like paperless office. Let's reduce cost of paper. Um, but increasingly now, software is eating the world. Pretty much every business is really now a software business. Uh, if you think of uh, companies that sell books, companies that do hotels, make cars, Cisco, I used to think of them as a network company, now they're a software company. Car manufacturers, they're mostly software companies now. Pretty much every business now is focused really on being a really good software business. We often use the word Ubering. We say our business might be Uberized because some small, nimble software company will come along and figure out how to develop software really well and disrupt traditional businesses that haven't yet figured out how to do software well, right? Um, we've got this perfect storm of the web, the internet, mobile, social media, um, AI, deep learning, internet of things, social media, this whole, and cloud, this whole uh, uh, group of technologies together has mean, meant if you're a software company and you can go fast, you can really disrupt almost any business. You can Uberize anything. So all of us now have to figure out how do we develop software uh, fast and well and good. Right? In the old days, we had years to write specifications and years to implement it, and we could release every decade at least, and life was good. Now we need to all go fast, right? Um, I particularly love this quote, it is not necessary to change, survival is not mandatory, right? In other words, change is coming, everybody's getting quite good at it, so we all have to become good at writing software fast. Now, writing some software is really easy, right? Well, there's millions of programmers out there who can sit at a keyboard and just type stuff in and just about get it to compile. Writing software is stupidly simple. The problem is developing the correct software is really, really hard, right? Because software is crazy complicated. Once you have the web and HTML and JavaScript and backend and databases and WebSockets and Reactive and Internet of Things, it gets crazy complicated crazy, crazy fast, right? Our systems are getting bigger and bigger and more and more complicated, and it's very easy to get lost in the weeds. So the only real way we've figured out how to write software, uh, well, is by going fast. It's by going fast and iterating and doing continuous improvement. Um, customers generally don't know what they want, right? So the worst thing you can do is ask a customer what they want and develop that and then go, yay, we've done it, because it won't be what they really want. Customers know what they don't want, so the, your best bet is to make something, show it to them, get feedback, then try something and show it to them again. You don't know what you need and they don't know what you need and all you can do is experiment and you'll end up vaguely getting there, but you only do it by iterating quickly. Right? If you expect to interview all of your customers, go away for a year in an ivory tower, develop and polish this thing and then un unveil it, you're going to be kind of disappointed. I hate to break it to you. It's only going to be version 4000 that's good. Version 1 is going to be terrible. Version 2 and 3, mm, getting there, but like 100 is going to be pretty cool. By 1000, you're going to be, well, I hope you're quite good by then. Uh, so it's all about speed and continuous iteration. Um, so we're all aiming for this kind of continuous improvement. So continuous integration, continuous testing, continuous delivery, continuous improvement. How many people here used continuous integration? Like, uh, yay, go you. Like Jenkins, how many people use Jenkins? Yay, go you. How many people do continuous delivery right now? Oh, oh, good crowd, oh, nice room. How many people would like to do continuous delivery right now? Yay, I love you guys. Uh, okay, that's awesome. So. Uh, we want to do continuous delivery of containerized microservices, right? That's pretty buzzwordy. Um, why containerized microservices well, and why microservices? Well, I'll talk about that in a minute, but in fact, let me talk about all of that. Um, say microservices one more time. So you've probably heard microservices quite a lot lately, right? But pretty much everybody's talking about it. It's the new hotness. It used to be SOA, and then before that it was web services. Well, maybe after that it was web services. And then it was objects, and then it was components. Um, microservices is definitely one of the new buzzwordy things. For me, microservices is all about two things, two really simple things. Now, pretty much every system we've ever built that's vaguely complicated, we draw a big diagram on a board, and we make lots of rectangles, and we name all the rectangles, and then we do lots of arrows and things, right? Pretty much every system is like that, right? 
And that's cool. We've been breaking down big bits of software into chunks for decades. This is not new. The new thing with microservices is each one of those rectangles is released independently. Right? This is the big change. You don't release the whole thing together because that, the bigger the software and the more complicated it is and the more people you get, the slower it takes to do anything. Because you have this huge amount of stuff and complexity and people to arrange. The way to go fast is each piece is released independently. It doesn't wait for anything. There's no schedule meetings. There's no figuring out which day we're going to go live. Each rectangle is released independently. Right? That's the big thing. Split your uh, big monolith into small pieces, release them independently. So it's th the first part is a release change. You have lots of releases of independent microservices. The next change is a social one. Now, often we have siloed teams. You have a team of analysts and a team of uh, developers and a team of testers and a team of operations people. The microservices approach is to have one team per microservice, and that one team does everything. So you have one small team, a two pizza team, six, eight people, and they do everything for one or two microservices. So they do design, development, testing, um, and they run it in production and they operate it in production. Now, once you switch from having vertical silos to having horizontal microservice teams, that one team does everything. And if you're one of the team that gets called at midnight, when, or two in the morning is maybe worse, depending on what happened the night before, um, if you get called on your phone because something's broken in production, you're going to work differently, right? If it's someone else's problem, you'll check in any old code and throw it over the wall, and you don't really care. But if you're getting called when things break in production, you tend to write code a bit differently, right? So having these small teams that know everything about these microservices, um, you kind of know everything about it. You know how the persistence works. You know how the release works. You know what release happened last week. You know what's going next week. It means everyone on the team can understand the whole scope of these microservices because they're much smaller. And everyone understands the whole scope from design, development, test, production, release, operate. Right? Um, I've been working in open source for a couple of decades. And there's something about your source code being public on the internet that makes you put a little bit of extra effort in. Well, OK, most of the people, I, I don't put too much effort in. But most of the people put a bit more effort in because their code's going to be on the internet forever. Right? Future employees can look at your source code. Right? So most people tidy it up a bit. In, in many ways, microservices is a similar thing. If you're writing code and you're going to manage it in production, you tend to go that extra mile to make sure it's not too clever or weird. It's doing simple stuff so that it's simple to uh, uh, restart if there's a problem. Right? You try and make it simpler and easier to run and manage rather than focusing on loads of crazy features that you maybe don't need. Right? So microservices are two things for me, really. One is split things up into small independent releases so they can go really, really quick, and then have one team per microservice that looks after the whole thing, so that, that one team can go as quick as they need. Right? So it's really about going fast. That's all microservices is. It's about going fast. The quicker you can go, the more you can iterate, the more likely it is you can get some significant business value in front of your customers, and the more feedback loops you can get, so the better your software becomes. Okay? So it's all about speed and iteration. Now, the interesting thing is, if you're building a monolith and you have, I don't know, 50 people working on a big, huge, really complicated thing that takes two weeks to release, um, you don't really care how long it takes to release because it takes two weeks. So it can all be manual and shell scripts and hacking Vi and doing all sorts of crazy stuff, right? As soon as you have 100 microservices that are releasing every hour, you kind of need to automate things. Otherwise, all you're going to be doing is doing releases, and you're not actually going to develop anything. So you want to automate everything, from the creation of projects, to building them, to testing them, to releasing them, to staging them, to promoting them, to rolling them forward, to rolling them back, to scaling them. All of this kind of rubbish that we used to manually do in the monolith days, because we didn't do it very often, now we need to automate all of this malarkey, because you're going to be doing a lot of it. right? We also want each team not to have to sit there and go, how do I do a build again? What's this Jenkins thing? How do I do staging? What about system testing? How does that work? How do I operate things? What we really want is everything to be automated. So every development team just comes along, creates a project, and they're, and they're off. And everything just kind of works. So we want a completely automated platform. So um, if the Wi-Fi works, uh, I'd like to show you one. Uh, so I work on an open source um, developer platform called Fabricate. Fabricate, as in to make things, to fabricate microservices. It's kind of like a joke. or It was a domain name we could find, basically. It's a domain name we could find that was vaguely easy to remember. Uh, so the Fabricate microservices platform is essentially a bunch of open source stuff. It's all completely open source. It's all Apache licensed. 
Um, and it's really targeted at development teams who want to go faster. So it's aimed at automating everything you need to do in your daily life, from creating new projects to building them, testing them, staging them, releasing them, running upgrades, and managing them, and all that kind of stuff. Now, it's I'll talk about the technology a bit later that's underneath it. There's things like Docker and Kubernetes and Jenkins and various other things. Um, but it's basically aimed at being a black box thing that your teams can just use and get stuff done really quickly and really easily. So in terms of features, it's got wizards to help you create projects. So the first thing is you can have lots of teams just spinning up projects right, and just trying things out. Trying a microservice in, say, I don't know, Spring Boot or Wildfly Swarm or Node.js or something. Trying something out, doing an experiment. Does it get good feedback? If it does, you keep going. If it doesn't, you maybe can it and maybe try another thing. So you're going to want to make it easy to create projects easily from wizards with a couple of clicks. Uh, you're then going to want to automate the build of those to turn them into immutable Docker containers. I'll talk about why you want to do that a bit later, but the basic idea is Docker container images are a really easy way of automatically provisioning that software in any environment. Right? From that one binary, we can then deploy that in testing, staging, production. We can just roll out that binary really, really simply. Um, so once we've done the release, um, we now have a version Docker image for our microservice. Then we want to manage it. We want centralized logging, centralized metrics. Once you start running lots of Docker containers in lots of different environments, um, gone are the days where you have little post-it notes with uh, IP addresses that you SSH into to look at magic files, right? You're going to need to collate all of the logs and metrics and put them in a single place so you can easily figure out what's going on and get feedback. So when a new release maybe goes slow, you get feedback. When a new release has a new issue or an exception, you get feedback. Uh, so you need centralized logging and metrics to manage them. Uh, and feedback, you need, it's not just having the metrics, you need to present them in a way that people can understand. So you need dashboards and reports and so on and so forth and alerts. Uh, finally, the platform. Um, these days, we have quite a diverse range of requirements. Sometimes you want to work on your laptop, sometimes you want to work on a little cluster you've got under your desk. Sometimes you have your own corporate data center somewhere you want to use because you've got one and you feel, feel like you should use it. Uh, and then sometimes you want to use the public cloud as well. So we want this platform to run everywhere, from your laptop to a bunch of machines to an on-premise data center to the public cloud and, and Cloudburst. It might be use the public cloud for testing, but use on-premise data centers for production because of re regulatory requirements or whatever. Um, if you don't have enough machines, we all should be using the public cloud, really, regulatory allowing, but it might be production isn't allowed to use the public cloud. So public cloud might be just for testing and load testing and soak testing and all that kind of stuff, and maybe on-premise data centers is production. So we need to work with a hybrid cloud world. Okay, so that's the vague idea of what Fabricate is. I figured the easiest thing is just to show you Fabricate. We'll make some microservices and play around with it a little bit. Then I'll go in to describe what's all the stuff under the covers and how it all works and that kind of stuff. Right, so I'm hoping the demo gods are, are working. Uh, let me see if it's uh, up. Okay, yeah, it's up. That's good. That's a good start. So this is the Fabricate web console. It's a uh, static HTML using AngularJS and all that kind of stuff. Um, each developer gets a number of teams. So here we're in team default, which is not a very good name. I should have picked a better one. Um, Let's first just look at the runtime. So this is the runtime stuff that's running for my team. So each team can choose their own development tools. So one team might want to use Jenkins and Nexus and uh, GOGs for Git hosting. So uh, let me make that bit, can you, you can just about read that. Let me make it a bit bigger. Um, so we're running GOGs, which is our Git hosting, on-premise Git hosting service. Um, you could use GitLab, you could use Atlassian Stash, you could use GitHub Enterprise. Um, we're using Jenkins for the continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, we're using Nexus as the artifact, artifact repository for jars and wars and POMs and tarballs and those kind of things, and YAML files for Kubernetes. Um, we, this is a Fabricate console. These are just some internal microservices that help everything work nicely. Uh, there's a Docker registry, and Fabricate Forge is um, a bunch of developer wizards for uh, creating projects, which I'll show you in a moment. So we've got a bunch of stuff running out of the box. Um, but Fabricate, this is, if you like, the base set of Fabricate. So this is, if you like, the minimal platform. We also have a little run menu, and we have um, gazillions of extra microservices, uh, which I'll briefly mention through in later on in the talk. Things like ChatOps, Gerrit, uh, Grafana, uh, Kubeflix, if you want to do some Netflix stuff, lots of chat, ChatOps malarkey, uh, messaging, Kafka, 
uh, social networking, Zookeeper, and various other bits and bobs. But I, I can't talk about much of that right now because I'm, I'm on a time deadline. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the basics, really, just the basics, which is Jenkins for CI and CD, Nexus as the artifact repository, um, and underlying uh, all of this is Docker containers. So let's look at the project dashboard. I created the project earlier. Um, so I'm going to create a new one, just in case my build failed. I thought I'd create one that I could show you. Um, and I'm going to create a brand new one now. Uh, and this is when I, I have my fingers crossed on the demo gods. So we have a whole raft of different quick starts for you, and wizards and various other things. Because um, different teams want different things. So you might want to use Spring Boot, you might want to use Wildfly Swarm, you might want to use Apache Camel for integration, you might want to use Node.js or Swift or Golang or .NET or Rails, I can't remember half of these, or uh, Django if you want to do Python, Function if you want to do Function as a service on top of Kubernetes. Um, there's a whole bunch of other wizards that, and Vertex I should have mentioned. Um, there's a whole bunch of other wizards in there. I'm going to pick a nice simple Spring Boot microservice here uh, and I'm going to call it J4 Rocks. I'm going to click Next. Now, one of the things I've not really talked about yet is pipelines. And Jenkins 2 introduced something called Jenkins Pipelines, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the basic idea is Jenkins Pipelines defines the entire end-to-end -end pipeline for your project. So how to do the build, how to do the system testing, how to um, migrate it to staging, how to migrate it to production, all those kind of things. And Fabricate comes with a whole list of these pipelines to avoid each team having to figure out how to write these pipelines from scratch. So we're going to pick a default pipeline which Basically, does a canary release, goes to testing, goes to staging, uh, and then goes to production if you approve it. So I'm going to click Next. Now, the build is going to take a couple of minutes. Um, by the way, I'm running all of this on my laptop, which I'll show you how to do later. I didn't want to show you how to do it now in case you used all the bandwidth downloading it. But as soon as I finish my demo, I'll show you how you can download it as well. Um, so the build is going to take a moment or two. While the build's happening, I'll just explain what I just did. So I used a wizard to create a new project. We have lots of different wizards. If you've ever used the start.spring.io wizard to create Spring projects, we have a wizard for that. We have a similar wizard for Wildfly Swarm. We have a whole bunch of Maven archetypes, if you've used those before, for Java EE and integration and yada, 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 plus a whole bunch of different archetypes for different programming languages. All of those wizards create a new project. That new project is then um, a Git repository is created for that project. All the source code is checked into the Git repository. The Git repository is then pushed into the Git repository server then we create a Jenkins job for the pipeline. Okay, so all of that has just happened under the covers. You'll see on this screen at the top, those are our environments for the current microservice we're on, which is JFall Rocks. And you can see the build pipeline is chugging along. We're still doing Canary release. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. While this is chugging along, I'm going to show you what happened under the covers. So if I click on this little tool button, we can see our development tools. Now, as you start running more and more development tools like Nexus, Artifactory, Gerrit, uh, Histrix, uh, Zipkin, you end up having more and more development tools, uh, Grafana, Kibana. Um, so this little handy uh, drop down is a really nice way of flicking between all your different development apps. If I look at GOGS, which is a Git hosting service, you'll see, th so this is a bit like an open source version of GitHub, right, that runs on premise. Um, and you can see we have a new Git repository we've created called J4 Rocks. And we've just committed all this new source code, which is the source code that then a developer would clone in their IDE or use a WebRace IDE to edit. Okay? So that's the project we've created. You notice inside the project we have a Jenkins file. So that is the Jenkins pipeline we created that does the canary release, the system testing, the promotion to staging, then promotion to production. So we've generated the Git repository, we've generated the source code, we've checked it all in. Um, it's being built, so it's going to production right now. Oh, it's built, awesome. So it's been built, so let's go look at the build. If you look in Nexus, which is our repository server, if I look in the repositories in the staging repository, uh, there we go, staging. If I look in there under org, example, uh, oh, all my other crap, <laughs> J4 Rocks, yay! So this is the 101 version, the first version of J4 Rocks that we've just released. So the POM XML and the JAR and the Kubernetes YAML and all that kind of stuff has been versioned, released into Nexus for us, so that's kind of cool. I don't know if you've ever tried to configure Nexus and Jenkins. I, I've probably lost a month, two months of my life just figuring those two things out, right? The beautiful thing about Fabricate is you install it and everything works, right? Jenkins works, Nexus works. I don't know if you noticed, but ne Jenkins build was using Nexus as a proxy cache, so as it downloaded the internet, it downloaded the internet into Nexus, then that Nexus downloads the internet onto a persistent volume in your build, so you never download the internet again. So the next build, there's nothing to download, which is awesome. 
really awesome. Oh, okay, so that's Jenkins and uh, Nexus. Oh, I didn't show you the Jenkins job. Oh, oh, I should go back, let me go back. Um, so we've run the integration test. Damn, I was hoping to show you that run for, for real. What that ran, I'll tell you how that works in a minute, but we ran a system test by taking the Docker image we've built and deploying it into a new namespace in Kubernetes, which I'll describe later what that is. In other words, we've created a dynamic test environment deployed the software into a dynamic test environment, checked it all works, it worked. So that stage went green, integration testing. Then it's now doing a rolling upgrade into staging. And I talked too slowly because that pit's happened already. So now it's already in staging. So our, our microservice is now deploying in the staging environment. It's now waiting for human approval to proceed to production. There's various different plugins for human approval. We have chat, we have issue trackers, we have Garrett and so forth. You could do it manually, you could do it whatever. Um, I'll talk about that later. Um, one thing I want to emphasize, by the way, before I do the proceed, I'll show you the proceed happening in a second. Um, what we're looking at is a visual screen that lets us, what we try to do is make a single pane of glass that shows you everything that's happening in your microservice. We have a team version of this that shows everything your team is doing as well, all of the environments. Each one of these environments is a link we can click to look inside. So I can look inside the staging environment and I can look at all the deployments in staging um, and I can see this is J4 Rocks and there's only one container running and I can say, oh, I'm gonna scale that up. No, I'll, I'll wait for production for scaling up. I'll come back to that. So we can, we can then look at all of the running containers and for each running container, we can look at the logs to see what's happening in that container and watch its logs dynamically and so forth. And we can open shells and look inside the containers um, or we can step back um, Oh, sorry, let me go back to this bit. There we go. Um, we can also look at the specific version that's running, and when we start doing rolling upgrades, that will make much more sense. Um, we can look at the git commit, and we can also click this little icon here to test it out. That icon, that icon only works if it's a web app or a REST API, and it has a REST endpoint. But if we click that, look at that for an awesome service. It says, hello world, isn't that amazing? Um, yay, hello world, woohoo, woohoo, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let me just show you the promote button, by the way. If I click proceed, and we go, yeah, proceed. So now it's gonna deploy to production. Um, notice it goes gray first, which means it started the container. Then it goes blue, and you might not be able to tell the difference, which means it started and it's running, but it's not ready. One of the things that Kubernetes has is something called a readiness check that says, tell me when the process is actually ready. For example, if you're making a Spring Boot app that does REST, it's only ready when you can talk HTTP to it. So Kubernetes will keep pinging the HTTP endpoint and go, it's not ready, it's not ready, it's not ready. Oh, I got 200, it's ready. So it goes, you see it's green now? So green means it's ready. Now the purpose of the blue-green is to mean, this isn't blue-green deployments by the way, don't get confused. Uh, the purpose of the green means it's ready, which means it gets added to the load balancer. So as you start scaling up or scaling down or doing rolling upgrades, it's only when things go green that things get new traffic, right? Which is good, because it means, uh, if you immediately add it to the load balancer, you'd get a 404 because it's not open to socket yet, right? Java takes a little while to warm up, right? It's kind of, it's like a classic car. You need to kind of warm it up a bit. And then it's good when it's going, but it, it doesn't start straight away. Um, also, you can then do your own uh, readiness checks because it might be you say, don't give me any traffic until I've loaded a, a bunch of data into memory. I've waited for Hibernate to initialize. I've connected to my database. I've sent some messages. I've whatever, preloaded a bunch of stuff. So you can do your own readiness checks, which is really, really awesome. Okay, so let's uh, do the production. Let's look at production. Um, and again, totally separate environment for production. Um, and if I look at the deployments, I can scale this up. Let's do, let's, let's live life on the edge of run three. And notice we get three pods pretty much instantly. Instantly, they start off gray, which means they're just starting. Blue means they're running, but not ready. Um, and then we should, see the, we should see them go green any second when, when Java's warmed up a bit and it's initialized spring and all the other spring malarkey and it's listening to HTTP. So hopefully those will go green soon, hopefully. Um, while that's happening actually, let me make a, a go green, go green, please go green. Um, I'm not even gonna wait for the green. I'm gonna keep it real. Um, I'm gonna go back to the uh, da app dashboard. So here we're looking at all of the microservices for a team. Now you might be, um, you might want to have one team for exactly one microservice, but sometimes that's a little bit granular. What tends to happen is one team might have a couple of microservices, because logic logically you might be doing, say, the payments gateway or something, and the payments gateway might need a database and it might need some Java code, or it might need some Java code and, I don't know, Redis or Kafka or something else. So many of your microservices might really be a couple of pieces which are deployed independently. Oh, we've gone green, yay, it goes. Um, 
So now let me show you how you make changes to code. Um, now, traditionally, you probably use an IDE, like IntelliJ, uh, which is the best one you should use. Or, the, or Eclipse, that's good too. Uh, uh, that's OK. Uh, uh, some people like that other one. Uh, yeah, let's not talk about that other one. Uh, <laughs> so, sorry. No, use whatever IDE. Use Vi if you like. Use, use you know, Emacs. Uh, it's all cool. Um, we, can, we can browse the code. By the way, in this, in this console, we can browse the source code. Now, I don't recommend you use this as your main IDE for hacking Java code. You might want to use uh, Eclipse J if you want a web-based one or a real ID. I was just going to change some code so you can see what happens when you do a rolling upgrade. So I'm going to change some code in this Spring, uh, Spring Boot Web MVC thing uh, to add a really informative, useful message. I'm going to say awesome. Um, and if I pop back, I'm just looking at the microservices dashboard. So this filters out all the other microservices. So you have kind of two modes. Show me everything my team's doing across all the environments, or just show me this one microservice, because that's all they want to watch. Um, and we'll see the builds kicked off. It takes a little while to make the uh, Canary release, because it's uh, hopefully not downloading the internet now, but it's making a new jar, publishing it to Nexus. Well, it's tagging, creating a new tag, tagging Git, building from that tag, creating a new version jar, putting it into Nexus, creating a new version Docker image, putting it into the uh, Docker registry, uh, which takes kind of 50 seconds. Um, then it's going to run the system tests. Then it's going to stage it to the staging environment. So in a few moments, we should see uh, 102 appear in the testing environment, and then we should see a rolling upgrade happen in staging. Now, rolling upgrades, I haven't really talked about that. Rolling upgrades is a feature of Kubernetes, which is underneath here, which I haven't really even talked about yet. Um, Kubernetes implements natively rolling upgrades. And what that basically means is you can deploy a new version of software while the old version is running to avoid downtime, right? So as you deploy 102, it will spin up some containers of 102, and you've still got 101 running, and then you can define how the rolling upgrade happens. For example, you can say, run just one new container every five minutes, and then slowly roll over. Like you might be running five containers on 101, and you might run that one container 102 and just wait a bit. And, is it working? Yeah, it's working, it's working. Let's run another. And you can gradually go like this. Or you can just manually go back. If things go wrong, you can just roll back and roll forwards. All that really happens is you have two levers that lets you scale up and down on these two different versions. It's really kind of simple. And then a load balancer just works across both of them. right? If you want to get clever, you can do clever A-B testing that decides which traffic goes to which new or old version, and you can really knock yourself out with wacky stuff. But the, normal, the default rolling upgrade works fine. OK, the build is done. That's cool. We're now on the integration testing. You can see on this pipeline, the Canary release is finished. Well, that was 1 minute 28. My laptop's not the fastest. That's not too bad. Um, now we're doing integration testing. Incidentally, everything I'm showing here is the continuous delivery pipeline. In other words, the stuff that happens after you've done a git commit and a git push. So this is normally not the thing you sit there and a developer laptop waiting to happen. This is the slower kind of version. Um, there's a pre-commit kind of workflow that I'll talk about later where I'm on my laptop, I've changed some code, and you just want to run it. So you can miss out all this stuff like tagging and pushing to Nexus and um, pushing Docker images to a registry. Oh, see, we've just done a rolling upgrade to 102. Well, actually, that's not a rolling upgrade. That just replaced it. So we basically deleted the old version and ran the new version. Uh, so there's only 102, and there's no rolling upgrade there. But as soon as the integration test pass, we should see a rolling upgrade happen in the staging environment, where it will run the new version, and then we'll scale down the old version. And you can configure in a blob of YAML how the rolling upgrade works. Do you want to go all in and just run all the new stuff? And when all the new stuff is running, you kill all the old stuff? Or do you want to kind of trickle it? Um, although you can always manually override as well once you've defined your policy. OK, I think that's everything I was hoping to do in the demo. Uh, oh, there's a rolling upgrade. Perfectly, perfectly on time. Oh, it was quick. It was a bit too quick. Um, notice uh, it just kind of rolled over a bit too quick there. I must have changed the config. OK, so 102 is now running a staging, and then we can promote it to uh, uh, production. If I click Approve, I'm just going to wait for the green, and then I'm going to click on it to show we changed our code. Um, I need to fix the uh, rolling upgrade as well, because it should have waited for green before it killed 101. Um, I think I might have broken something in my build. OK, there we go. Awesome. OK, we've made the code change. That was good. So just to recap, we did a couple of clicks. We created a project. The project was released to production without writing any code. 
it was all automated. We have a system test in place, we have a staging environment in place, and we have a production environment in place. Each of these environments are independent. Each team gets their own testing environment, staging environment, and production environment. You can configure the environments on a per team basis. You can set whatever quotas you want per team. It might be you don't have much hardware resource, so you only get two environments each, so you might not have staging, you might just have testing. So you can play around with the exact semantics of how many environments you have and how much quota each team gets, but basically each team immediately gets their own environments, everything's created automatically, and with a few clicks you create a microservice, it's built, it's versioned, it's deployed as an immutable Docker image, it's tested for you, tested as in tests it provisions and doesn't bath. You have to write a bit more unit tests to do like more hardcore testing, um, and it's released to production with, with no code changes, um, all just a few clicks. So that's the quick uh, overview. How do you get started? Now, now I've done my demo, so I don't care about the network bandwidth. So now I'll show you how you can install it on your laptop right now. Um, so if you go to the fabric8.io website and you scroll down a little bit, there's two green buttons. Install locally or install on the cloud. Install locally is if you want to run it right now on your laptop, um, or run it right now on a Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster you happen to already have. You probably don't have any of those things, so you'd, well, you just have a computer, hopefully. So uh, this is how you install it on a computer. You basically download this binary, that's a Go Fabricate binary, click on that link, and then you run Go Fabricate Start. That's pretty much it. And then it basically installs something called Minikube, which boots up a single node cluster of Kubernetes on your laptop. It works on a Mac, it works on Windows, it works on Linux. Um, it then installs Fabricate on top, and then you can just do everything I just did on your laptop. Um, I'm doing everything I just did with the same thing. I ran Go Fabricate Start on my laptop and did this demo. So you can do this demo right now. You need some memory in your laptop. You may need like eight gig of RAM-ish is, is for everything. Uh, if you've got a small laptop, you can run a cut-down version, which is just the console and lets you do um, pre-commit development, where you just build stuff and run it. But if you want to do the whole CD thing with Jenkins and Nexus and all that kind of stuff, Eight gig of RAM is, is, would be nice. Um, or, or use a real server somewhere, or use the public cloud. Um, if you don't have much memory, um, use the public cloud. If you click on install the public cloud, it describes how to do it. There's a lovely website called stackpoint.io, uh, which I'll open now, um, which has a little wizard that just says, which cloud do you want to use? You authenticate with Google, um, then it says, which cloud do you want to use? Amazon is your... Uh, Google or DigitalOcean, and then it'll install Fabricate for you. You pick how many machines you want, whatever, it'll boot it all up, you can then play with it, and then tear it all down whenever you like, um, and it's really, really simple. So that's how you get started. Um, now before I get kicked off the stage, I'm going to describe what happens under the covers. Uh, so the core pieces of Fabricate are really three, we stand on the shoulders of three big giants, Docker, Kubernetes, and Jenkins. Now, quite a lot of hands went up for Jenkins, so I know you know that piece, but Docker, you've probably heard of Docker. Everybody's been talking about it for two years now. Um, Docker is now the way we package software into Docker containers or container images so we can run things. Remember, this is all about speed and, we, and automation. And gone are the days where you have to have an installer and a Word document that you give people that says, understand that installer and figure out how to install this thing on some version of Linux that's probably different to the one that actually works. Um, those days are gone, right? What we want is a Docker image that just runs out of the box, right? You package your software, you put it in an image, and that image just runs anywhere, right? No installer. Installers are over. Um, this is the one command line you can run on your laptop or any machine. Docker run, a couple of command line arguments, and then the name of a Docker image, and that will run a Node.js app, a Ruby app, a Rails app, a Erlang app, uh, whatever they are, uh, uh, Node.js, Groovy, Java, anything. So that can run any application that's packaged as a Docker container. So that's Docker, it's the universal packaging structure for software. We should all be using it for all software that's Linux at least. Eventually Windows as well. One day all software, hopefully, but right now it's anything that runs on Linux. Kubernetes, so Kubernetes, how many people have heard of Kubernetes? Oh, this is a really good room, thank you, thank you. Um, so Kubernetes started two years ago from Docker. Uh, Docker's been running Linux containers. So Docker's all about, uh, Docker's all about Linux containers. Uh, Google's been running Linux containers for about a decade in production, right? Everything at Google runs in a Linux container, like everything. Google Search, Gmail, Google AdWords, 
uh, Hangouts, everything at Google, YouTube, everything at Google runs in, in Linux containers, right? So these things totally work. Google initially invested in Linux containers because they realized every couple of percent they, they increase in utilization, it saves them millions of dollars worth of hardware that they could then hire more developers with, which is a kind of a smart thing. Virtualization is basically like burning hardware, right? Every time you run a VM, you're running a whole copy of an operating system just to run a program. The whole idea of containers is you don't run the operating system, you just run the program, but just in a kind of a pseudo virtualized way so that the containers can't interact with each other, right? So on your laptop in containers, you could run 10 Tomcats. They all think they're listening on port 8080, but they're not really. The Linux uh, uh, hypervisor, well, not a hypervisor, but the Linux C groups and, and namespaces is hiding ports from each other. So they all think they're in a VM, but they're not really. So Kubernetes is all about running containers at scale. Now, what Google has figured out pretty well is how do you run billions of containers at scale and do things like rolling upgrades and keep them running. One of the most important things when you start moving to microservices is as you're running tens, hundreds of microservices, you want these things to keep running, right? You don't want to keep doing PS on random machines to go, is it there? Is it there? Is it still there? You want to say, run five of my Tomcats and keep running. Keep them running, and if one of them dies, start it again. If, if, it, if it core dumps, restart. If the machine dies, run it somewhere else. This is what Kubernetes does. Kubernetes runs whatever you want it to run, and it keeps it running, right? which is awesome. And it does all the load balancing and the networking and all those kind of things. Um, this is the Kubernetes version, by the way, of the Docker command, kubectl. Um, it's, it's spelt kubectl, but uh, Kubernetes people call it kubectl, which is really cute. Um, so this is the version. Notice there's a minus minus replicas. Uh, which basically says run five containers and keep them running. And whatever happens with hardware, you can add and remove boxes and whatever and, and kill minus nine things on boxes and it all kind of works. So that's Kubernetes. You basically install a bit of software on all your boxes, it turns it into basically a mainframe or supercomputer, right? Kubernetes, think of it as a distributed operating system, it's awesome. It's small, it's lean, it's mean. If ever you've tried to install Cloud Foundry, it's like 36 VMs, I think, right now to do Hello World. Uh, Kubernetes is a binary on a box. It's a single go, small go binary. It's tiny, right? You can run it on your laptop. It's really simple. Right, Jenkins, we know about Jenkins. Um, the big difference with Jenkins is Jenkins 2 has, has, has came out this year and it's got something called Jenkins Pipelines. And this is the thing we use in the demo. Um, a pipeline is, is a file called a Jenkins file. Just like you have make and make file, now we have Jenkins and Jenkins file. And this is a groovy DSL, which is awesome, which is really nice. Uh, it's a groovy DSL for describing the steps of your build. So it defines how to build, how to do a release, how to do a system test, how to do staging, how to do human approval, and so on and so forth. Uh, Fabricate comes with a whole library of reusable Jenkins files that just work in different uh, programming languages and frameworks, um, plus a bunch of functions that you can use in your own uh, uh, libraries, in your own Jenkins files. For example, things like wait for something to sync into Nexus, wait for a pull request to be merged, all those kind of useful things you need to do in your pipelines. Okay, I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to keep going. Um, those were the core pieces, Docker, Kubernetes, and uh, Jenkins, but there's a whole raft of other technologies we, we make use of that are all open source as well. Um, here's a small selection of them, but there's actually way more than that. It's actually quite scary. But they're all microservices all the way down, so you can opt in and out of any of these things, right? So you can run, once you've got the basics, you can add any of the extra cool stuff on top if you like. Logging metrics are the two key ones that you should always run. For logging, we use Elasticsearch. That stores all of the log statements from every Docker container, every JVM, every Java program that has a Java util logging or a SLF for J or a What's the other one? Log4j, SLF4j, uh, Java util logging. Yeah, those are the three. Uh, any one of those statements in any JVM gets captured automatically by FluentD and then dumped into Elasticsearch. So you have centralized logging with all the metrics and all the metadata. You know, every app, every version, every uh, microservice name, every team, you can query and slice and dice all your logs really simply with a front end called Kibana. From a metric side of things, it's similar but different. We use something called Prometheus, which does the same for logs. So a log is like a blob of JSON, right? Some text and key value pairs. Metrics is all about having historical charts of a number, like CPU load, uh, disk usage, I.O., swaps, and so forth, network usage. Um, so something called Prometheus captures every metric that's in a Linux container, in the operating system, in HAProxy, in DNS, in JMX. All of those metrics get captured, annotated with all the key value pairs, like what app is it, which team are you, and so forth, and stored in Prometheus, and then Grafana does the front end for charting and whatnot. 
So here's an example Kibana dashboard that shows all of the commits, all of the builds, all the deploys, and all of the summaries of the log statements across all of the microservices in one team. I don't have time to explain those diagrams. Here's an example Kibana dashboard that just shows a fairly simple dashboard of CPU usage and memory across a bunch of different pods. Um, tracing with Zipkin, I don't have too much time to talk about this, but once you start using microservices, you only know your microservice well and everything else is just something you call. You could, suddenly you might have a slowdown where you inv invoke a microservice and it's taking too long. Something called Zipkin will instrument all of the network operations so you can see the call stack and see where things are slowing down. A little bit like method profiling back in the day where you're optimizing your code, this is about optimizing external microservices. Uh, there's a similar thing with if you want to make your microservice resilient to failure, you can use something called uh, circuit breakers, which means if the thing I'm calling is taking too long, um, just fail, back, fail, tell me it's failed, and then I'll do something else. For example, if my WYSI recommendation engine is, is not coming back within five seconds, just return some canned data that says, you know, buy more stuff, um, and at least you give your customers a decent response. There's a nice dashboard that's integrated with Fabricate that visualizes all of the circuit breakers across all of your applications in real time, so you can see what's going slow, you can see which circuit breakers have closed, and all that kind of malarkey. ChatOps is increasingly the best way of keeping your microservices teams in touch with each other. Um, people are not always in the same room. Ideally, people would have offices with, with doors so you don't get interrupted all the time. Um, so ideally, you'd be, you'd be disparate. So chat is a really nice way to keep people in the loop. We have a bunch of chat ops features. For example, every time there's a deployment in any of your environments, a message will appear in the chat room so you can see what's happening. Every time somebody scales up or down production, you can get a message so everyone sees something's happened in production. Um, Plus, you can, you can create releases from inside your chat window, and then everybody sees you've just triggered a release, and you can see it finishes. And you can do approvals and so forth. OK, I'm almost out of time. Um, Maven, uh, how many people do Java? OK, yay! How many people do Maven? Yay, we love it, don't we? It's OK, everybody hates all build tools. It's awesome. I, I, I kind of love it. Uh, everything kind of sucks, though, as a build tool. Here's three Maven goals you need to know. The first, the first Maven goal adds the Fabricate Maven plugin to your project. So if you have a Java project right now that maybe makes a war or an executable jar or something like that, run the first command that will add the Fabricate Maven plugin into your pom. Run the second command if you haven't already installed Fabricate yet, and that will install Fabricate for you. And if you run the third one, that will run your app in Kubernetes via Fabricate, and it looks like it's running locally, right? It, all the logs will appear on the console, and if you press Control-C, it stops. So it fools you into thinking you're running on your laptop, as in like Mac or Windows. What it's really doing is making a Docker image, pushing it into Kubernetes, making Kubernetes scale up a container, and then piping the output to your terminal so you're running on your laptop the same stuff that you would run in production. Right? You always want to be running the same stuff that's in production. You don't want to be testing out Mac's JDK or the Windows JDK when production is using Linux. You always want to be using Docker containers and Linux. So this is how you do it. You do Maven call and run, and then you forget that you're even not running it on your laptop. Well, you are running on your laptop, right? But it's, you're running the real stuff on your laptop, not the pretendy stuff. So please use Maven Fabricate Run. It's really, really awesome. Um, I don't have time to talk about service discovery, but the quick trick is you just use DNS and everything just works. It's awesome. Um, so if you want to talk to a database, you, you, you define something called, uh, you might talk to a database called Cheese. You define a service called Cheese, and then you just use Cheese as the host name, and that will resolve to the test Cheese, the development Cheese, the staging Cheese, or the production Cheese. And Kubernetes takes care of all that load balancing and discovery for you. you. You don't have to do dollar squigglies or profiles or all that kind of weird crap. Just use names and it, everything works. Uh, so that's cool. I'm totally out of time, so I'm going to keep talking until someone kicks me off the stage. Uh, use. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I should stop. I should stop. It's okay.